Good afternoon, everybody. Everyone can hear me? Great. I'm Mark Cantor. I'm the chair of the Jewish Heritage Center of Western Canada. Welcome to all of you for being here this afternoon. The Jewish Heritage Center of Western Canada acknowledges that the province of Manitoba is located on the territories of Treaties 1 through 5 and on the ancestral lands of the Anishinaabeg, Cree, Oji Cree, Dakota, and Dene peoples, and on the national homeland of the Red River Métis. We respect and honor the treaties and agreements that were made on these lands we share, and we remain committed to strengthening our relationships with First Nations, Métis, and Inuit in the spirit of reconciliation and collaboration. The Jewish Heritage Center serves to preserve and promote information on Jewish history and culture in Canada and to develop awareness of the historical, moral, and ethical implications of the Holocaust and other human rights violations. Our mission is to serve as an advocate for anti-racism and education on the Holocaust and anti-Semitism. With that said, I'm now going to ask uh, our executive director, Bel Jarneski, to come up and to introduce our speaker. Thank you, Mark, and welcome, everyone. And a gentle reminder that I often forget, check your cell phones and please make sure that they are on, on silent. Um, Today's program is the last of four, our month-long presentation to mark Holocaust Education Month. I'd also like to take this opportunity to congratulate the Manitoba NDP government for announcing that Holocaust education will be mandated in Manitoba schools. Thank you to Nello Altamari, absolutely. Our new Minister of Education and the Deputy Minister, Brian O'Leary, both of them former educators, for taking the time to meet, to discuss implementation and resources and forging a path forward. And I'm looking forward to, to working with them. And just a, a little note of history, at the time, we looked into our archive and we found a document from 50 years ago, the first time that uh, people reached out to the provincial government to mandate Holocaust education. So it did take half a century, but it's done. So on to today's program. Professor Ralph Stern's talk today is entitled Two Streets and a Synagogue, Urban Encounters in Nazi Berlin. One of the titles, Two Streets, is in central Berlin's post-war east, a short walk from what was Gestapo headquarters as well as what became Checkpoint Charlie and now the new Jewish Museum. The other street is in the former West, existing today, as it was built in the first years of the last century, just off the Kurfürstendamm, lined with Berlin's famous cafes and cinemas. The synagogue under discussion miraculously survived the 1938 November pogrom, which we often refer to as Kristallnacht, largely intact only to be repurposed as a deportation center for tens of thousands of Berliners sent to the East. So without further ado, it's now my pleasure to introduce Professor Ralph Stern to you. As an architect, Ralph received his professional and academic education in the United States and Germany. He has held professional licensure in Germany, in Berlin, and maintains licensure in the United States, New York, and in Canada, Manitoba. He's worked for internationally renowned firms such as Richard Meyer and Partners, as well as Cohn Peterson, Fox and Associates, and was an active council member of the Manitoba Association of Architects from 2011 to 2021. Prior to joining the University of Manitoba as Dean of the Faculty of Architecture, Professor Stern also taught in the United States and Europe, including the Technical University Berlin and the University of the Arts Berlin, where he was co-director of the Program for Urban Processes. 
He served as visiting faculty for the city's program at the London School of Economics, the Graduate School of Architecture, Planning, and Preservation at Columbia University, and the History, Theory, and Criticism of Architecture and Art program at MIT. He has also been a research associate in the Faculty of Architecture at the University of Cambridge and a visiting fellow at the Bauhaus University in Weimar. Ralph lectures extensively and has presented research at Harvard, Yale, Columbia, MIT, University of Chicago, School of the Art Institute of Chicago, and the Dallas Architecture Forum. He's also lectured at the Architectural Association London, University of Edinburgh, Cambridge University, American Academy and Bibliotheca Herziana in Rome, Werner Uxland Foundation, Charles University Prague, Central European University Budapest, Art Historical Institute of Heidelberg University, Berlin Academy of the Arts and the Bauhaus University Weimar, as well as the Jewish Heritage Center of Western Canada, among other venues. His publications include studies on Berlin cinema, the destruction of the Second World War, and Berlin's post-reunification architecture. Recently, he has turned his attention to issues of memorialization and Berlin's Jewish history under the National Socialist regime. Thank you. Um, thank you to Mark and to Bell for the opportunity to speak today. And uh, I would have to say a special thanks to Bell, to whom I know I owe more than she can possibly know. So thank you. Um, I, I just wanted to start today. Uh, I, I don't have a text that I'm reading from. I'm going to show you a lot of images. Um, how many of you have been to Berlin? Okay, so quite a number. And how many of you are architects? And okay, wow, wonderful. Okay, so uh, the the approach I'm taking here uh, is an approach where I'm talking about personal histories, and I'm also talking about architectural and urban histories. So these are sort of two parallel tracks. And the reason I'm taking this approach, what interests me, is to understand what people, what exactly they saw, what exactly they experienced in Berlin. So this is a Berlin-specific talk. And so many of the records of photographs, family photographs, letters, uh, memoirs have been lost. Often if there are memoirs or if there are recollections, the recollections revolve around persons and events, and that's only natural. But partially you can also reconstruct what people actually lived, what their lived experiences were. And that is sort of my interest in approaching this topic. And this is the first time through for me on this lecture, so we'll see if it works. Uh, but this is why this poster has two city plans on it, and I'll come back to the city plans themselves, as well as uh, an image of the synagogue, which I'm going to be speaking about, and of a monument, which I'm also going to speak, be speaking about. So I would like to uh, dedicate this talk personally to uh, the little girl in the photograph. The little girl is Marion Ehrlich. And she is there with her brother on the left, Gerd. I will mention Gerd in the talk, and a friend of Gerd's. I don't know who the caps are, um, but the, the Ehrlich family were shareholders in the Berlin Zoo. And so I'm going to just mention some things along the lines of this talk that I won't go, I won't elaborate on. But the history of the Berlin Zoo in excluding Jews from being able to enter the zoo or being shareholders in the zoo is one of the more pernicious histories in Berlin. It's a very specific and early history where Jews were excluded from the zoo very early on. 
And the zoo, even today, is somewhat reluctant to actually deal with this history. There, there has been a researcher, Monica Schmidt, who has dealt with this history. So this is a photograph, obviously, not taken at home, but taken in the Berlin Zoo. So, and just to underscore, the talk is dedicated to Marion Ehrlich. One of the things I want to talk about is the issue of memorialization in Berlin as well. How these sites are remembered, how sites are marked, the different ways of approaching these sites. I have learned an awful lot from Marion and Marion's story, and I think particularly through this article, many other people have learned a lot from Marion as well. And this was published a year ago in The Atlantic. When I first saw this, it was my partner, Simona, who brought this Atlantic cover to my attention. I was really shocked, and I can speak a little bit more about why this particular photograph became the cover of the Atlantic. I also wanted to then say, what does all of this have to do with Manitoba, and what does this have to do with the Holocaust Education Center here? And this family tree, the Stammbaum, is on display downstairs. And if we zoom in on this tree, uh, we can see here there are many different lines. And what we're looking for is this one very particular lineage here, which we'll zoom in on a little bit more. And what we're seeing here is uh, Edward Stern, the first son of the marriage between uh, Philip Stern and his wife Henrietta, here Yetta, and uh, Marion Ehrlich is the great granddaughter of Edward Stern. And so this is, this is one story, this is one trajectory out of many trajectories that I can speak to, but this is, this is just simply this one particular trajectory and this is what ties it back to the exhibit that is down or down the hallway here. Uh, this is Gertrude Stern. This is uh, Edward Stern's granddaughter. Gertrude grew up in Berlin. Gertrude is Marion's mother. And this is Gertrude at the end of the 19th century. Gertrude grew up here in this building on the left here uh, in an area called the Bavarian Quarter in Berlin. So this is all built at the turn of the century. This is all upper middle class housing. And this was very largely a Jewish neighborhood. Uh, not exclusively, but largely so. Um, if we just pay attention to this building here, it'll give you some orientation as to this building, which is across the street from where Gertrude grew up. And it is in this building uh, that this couple lived. So <clears throat> there are comments embedded in, let's say, family narratives about running into the Einsteins, you know, just going shopping on the street, right? So this is this neighborhood, this underscores just the, the character of the neighborhood. This is um, Marion at a slightly older age, uh, very shy. This is her brother, Gerd, and uh, Gertrude, her mother, and the man that Gertrude married, Hugo Ehrlich. Hugo Ehrlich comes from East Prussia. He grew up in a small town, and he studied law in Rostock, and then came to Berlin, as many Jews did, and established a legal practice and also became a, a notary. And I also wanted to make a special mention today for a, with regard to this individual. This individual is Benno Walter. Benno Walter was a close family friend and at the end of this talk I will sort of bring Benno Walter's role in this story back into play. Benno Walter has been himself somewhat lost to history. This is the only photograph that I know of that has survived. Uh, it was actually ca cataloged under, not even his name, just simply a, a particular designation. And Benno Walter was a very, I, I think a very recognized individual on whom more work, more academic work, more research needs to be done because he was the grand vice president of the Berlin Lodge of B'nai B'rit. Uh, 
And uh, as far as I understand, the workings of B'nai Brit in Germany, uh, both the, the, the grand president and the grand vice president had positions that were five-year positions. All the other presidents of particular lodges uh, were elected on an annual basis. Um, the archives for B'nai Brit were taken by the Russians to Moscow after the end of the war. And uh, I guess I'd have to say I'm not going to go to Moscow anytime soon to research these archives. But I would really like to see these archives. Um, of course, the, the great president, the grand president of B'nai Brit was Leo Beck himself. And so Benno Walter and Leo Beck worked you know, on a daily basis w with each other in, you know, in B'nai Brit. And the story of B'nai Brit and how B'nai Brit was started in Germany and the numbers of lodges that it had in Germany and then the lodges that it opened in Czechoslovakia is a really, really interesting story. It's something that the Nazis really, of course, wanted to shut down very quickly. Uh, Himmler himself had a real allergy against the lodges, any lodges. He also wanted to shut down the Masons quickly. And there was something of a break that was put on Himmler's uh, attempts to shut down the lodges early on by apparently Hitler himself because he was afraid of the international backlash that would occur in 1933, 1934 um, if, if the lodges were, were shut down too quickly. Let's just put it that way. These are all long and involved stories, and they aren't the point of the talk today. Um, Benno Walter was arrested very early on. Uh, he was arrested very early on for holding a lecture after public lectures were forbidden. Um, we, I mean, the, the Nazis forbade B'nai Brit to hold any public lectures. So he held a private lecture, but there was a spy, and the spy said, well, it like, kind of looked like a public lecture. And so Benno Walter was arrested. It made the New York Times, it made the various papers, it made uh, papers in Detroit, it made various Jewish papers throughout North America because he was an individual of note and because of the position of B'nai Brit in Germany and the concerns that people had already in the early 1930s after the Nazis first came to power of what would happen to B'nai Brit. He was imprisoned here in this particular prison uh, this prison is, is called Columbia House. Uh, this is, uh, became a very notorious uh, prison for the first years of the reign of the Gestapo. It was built as a military prison in the late 1920s. It was abandoned as a military prison, and the Gestapo then repurposed it essentially as a Gestapo prison and as a center of torture. And it is in this prison, one of the reasons it's a notable site is that uh, a lot of uh, commanders of concentration camps received their early training here. And already in 1936, uh, uh, Reiner uh, Heydrich actually called this, which had been called Columbia House, he actually called this uh, Katset Columbia House, or Katset, yeah, Katset Columbia House. And so Katset means concentration camp, right? So this was understood within the Nazi regime as already being a concentration camp. And where it was located, which is quite surprising, is right here in this area. So it's really located in the inner part of the city. And it was demolished to make way for the construction of the great National Socialist Building, Tempelhof Airport. Right, so that is why that prison was torn down, was simply to, to build Tempelhof Airport. There is a, um, there is a, a small memorial, if we're talking about how sites are memorialized, that is across the street from where it was located. It was really located where this structure now exists. But this is the only real reference to it, and it is one of the sites that in many ways, in terms of public memory, has kind of disappeared from the discourse of where sites are and what roles various sites had to play. I mentioned that it was one of the training sites for future um, uh, prison camp, concentration camp directors, one of whom was um, Karl Otto Koch, 
And Karl Otto Koch became the commander of Sachsenhausen before he became the commander of Buchenwald. And of course, Ilse Koch, his wife, uh, really went down in infamy because of her activities in Buchenwald. Um, Karl Koch, interestingly enough, was he was he was executed by firing squad in April of 1945 uh, because he was charged with embezzlement of funds in Buchenwald, and so he was executed by firing squad by the Nazis. Uh, Ilse was tried. Uh, her first sentence was commuted by General Clay, of all people, which caused an uproar. She was tried again. And in 1964, she hung herself in her prison cell. So she was still in prison in the 1960s. But this, one of the reasons I'm showing this is that what I found in doing this kind of history is that you, you begin to touch on something and there are all these, I mean, there's sort of abysses, right, that open up, these, these, these kind of, you're stepping into these histories and how do you make sense of all of these histories? How do you make sense of the intersectionality of all of these histories, all of these stories? So it is in this prison, at any rate, that Benno Walter ended up. He wasn't there for very long, presumably because the American embassy, given the pressure out of the United States, brought pressure to bear on the Gestapo, and so he was released. And to the best of my knowledge, he was never incarcerated again uh, until much later. Uh, he doesn't seem to have been incarcerated in Sachsenhausen following uh, Reichs Kristallnacht. However, Hugo Ehrlich was. And Sachsenhausen, this is the plan of Sachsenhausen, this is a military photograph from 1944-45. And it shows just the geometry of Sachsenhausen, which is in Oranienburg. Oranienburg is just outside of Berlin. You can reach it on city rail. And at the time that it was built, the architect who designed it and built it referred to it quite publicly as being the most beautiful concentration camp in Germany. So there, there's, there are other layers here as well of you know, it's not just the Gestapo, it's not just sort of the upper echelon of Nazi officials, but it's also the complicity of professions throughout. And the architecture profession is not one to be excused from this. There are many architects that were very complicit, you know, throughout the Nazi regime. Um, this is a contemporary view of Sachsenhausen, and this was interestingly enough a photograph that was shown in an exhibit that took place last summer in the Academy of the Arts in Berlin at Pariser Platz in the very rooms that Albert Speer had used for his studios. So there are, again, these sort of deep and very complex residences. So come back, First Street. First Street is in, as, as Bell had mentioned, in the former East. It's called the Mauerstrasse. It is part of the original, let's say, inner city of Berlin, and I'll come to some images of that. I just wanted to show this because this is the poster background, right? So I want to deconstruct this poster as part of this talk. And a point of reference is always the rondelle here, which was uh, actually called Belle Alliance, which is the French name for Waterloo. So this was named after the defeat of Napoleon. Uh, up here we have Pariser Platz, and this was also named Pariser Platz after the defeat of Napoleon. And this is Leipziger Platz, which was named Leipziger Platz also after the defeat of Napoleon. So this, this issue of what is inscribed in the names and in the sites of Berlin is actually a very resonant one and, and certainly goes back to the 19th century. And obviously Napoleon is back in the news because of the new Ridley Scott film. Um, these two dots here, this is Mauerstrasse, so Mauer Street 3. This is where Marion was born, this is where Gerd was born, and this is where Hugo and Gertrude first moved to after they were married. And the blue dot is where uh, Benno Walter lived. So they studied law together in Rostock. They moved more or less together, as far as I can tell, to Berlin. They're both attorneys, they both set up their practices, and they're essentially neighbors, right? Benno lives around the corner from Hugo. Uh, 
One of the things that they would have experienced, of course, just off of Leipziger Platz, is the great Wertheim department store. The Wertheim department store is, of course, a Jewish department store. This is part of the history of Jewish textile production and then the founding of the great department stores and the great department store buildings in Germany, um, often sometimes built by Jewish architects, but almost always owned by Jewish owners. These were, of course, Aryanized when the National Socialists came to power. They're also subject of all of the boycotts, of course, that the Nazis instituted from very early on in the Nazi regime. This is one of the courtyard spaces. This sort of indicates what kind of opulence was in that neighborhood. So the question is, what does a neighborhood look like, right? Hugo and Gertrude and Benno would have gone shopping here, right? I think that can go without saying. This is part of their world. They don't write about that, but it's part of their world. In the address book of 1919, so it's a question, how do you know this and how do you verify this? You can see that um, Hugo Walter, right, this, uh, Hugo Ehrlich, this is on the Ehrlich page, is listed here, and here you see the address, Mauerstrasse 3. And you can see that he's a doctor of law. And you can also see, actually, uh, which courts he's allowed to practice law in. So that list gets longer as his career advances. And then there are two important Jewish address books that were published at the end of the 20s and 1930s. These are really helpful points of reference. Um, obviously, this was the last one as of 1933. Nothing like this appeared again. But here again, you see him also with his designation as being a notary. Being a notary meant that he had a lot of work to do with the American embassy because he was simply notarizing official documents for the embassy. The embassy was not far away from where he lived. And so at a certain point in 1933, he was offered the opportunity to leave Germany, that the embassy said, hmm, why don't you go? And he decided to stay. There are a number of reasons as to why he decided to stay, but he stayed. So in terms of the overall view of Berlin, uh, the little red dot here, you can see, yeah, okay, this all works. This is um, the, the site that I'm going to be talking about, Mauerstrasse 3. After they moved from here, they moved to a site here, which I'm not going to be talking about today. They weren't here for very long. They're here for just a couple of years. And then they moved to this location in the West. So this is the overall sort of trajectory of where they're moving in Berlin. The synagogue that I'm going to be talking about is where the yellow dot is here. And just as a point of reference to all of you who have been to Berlin or know the architecture of Berlin, the, uh, the synagogue in the Oranienburger Straße is this dot. And this other green dot here is the first Jewish cemetery to be opened in Berlin, which was opened actually in 1672. And then the second one, which was opened in the early 1800s, is up here in the Schoenhauser Allee. And the really large Jewish cemetery is further outside of the city, the Weissensee Cemetery. Um, this cemetery still exists. This cemetery exists as a park, and the Weissensee Cemetery still is active, actually. Um, this is just zooming in a little bit more, just a little bit closer. And just for those of you who may not know what these two sites actually entail, uh, this is an image of the synagogue in the Oranienburger Strasse. And uh, this was built in 1865. This was the second uh, synagogue to be built in Berlin. It was a very important synagogue, both in terms of um, the tendency towards reforming, towards liberalizing Judaism in Berlin following um, uh, Moses Mendelssohn's teachings and his efforts to essentially uh, turn services into, you know, hold services in the German language instead of Yiddish or Hebrew and this sort of general tendency of liberalization. It's also the first synagogue that had an organ. And so this becomes an issue of the introduction of music into services. And as such, it had an odd position in the, right after it was completed within the Jewish community as to 
what can actually take place there, who will actually participate in services in this particular synagogue. The construction itself was, at this point in time, uh, highly modern construction because the dome is constructed out of uh, wrought iron. So this was really uh, technologically a very advanced structure, even though it is participating in what was referred to as the Moorish style of architecture, which also had to do somewhat with identity construction and the discussion between Ashkenazi and Sephardic Judaism, right, as to where are the actual roots and what do these synagogues refer to. This became an exemplar for synagogues that were built uh, later on in Eastern Europe. So it became, there are many synagogues in Ukraine that followed essentially this model of synagogue construction. Um, here is just a rendering of what the interior looks like. One of the contemporary reviewers referred to it as the interior is just as colorful as a Turkish carpet. So this was how it was sort of understood. And I think it's just an important thing to see this rendering because the photographs are obviously all black and white photographs and this is what it looked like. It is in this synagogue that Gerd Ehrlich had his bar mitzvah. Um, these are contemporary photographs. The history of the synagogue and why it survived, Rice Kristallnacht, is also an interesting history, but it, it is a museum today. It doesn't serve liturgical purposes. It is well guarded by police because of the, let's say, the ongoing concern in Germany about attacks. Um, but it is quite a remarkable structure. It's actually really beautiful. The second site is, of course, the cemetery. This is the, uh, an older photograph from before the Second World War uh, with, in this case, this is a Protestant church in the background. This is the Sovian Kersha. Off, what you're seeing sort of ghosted in here is the largest Jewish school that was in Berlin. There's a very particular history about that school as well. And what would be off to the right here, or to the left out of frame, uh, is an old age home. It was a care facility for the Jewish community. And one of the things that the Gestapo did relatively early on is they decided that they needed these collecting points for people who were to be deported is that they moved all of the people who were living in this care facility to Theresienstadt and then they used the care facility as a collection point for everybody who was about to be deported. So this was one of the major collection points. The synagogue that I'm going to speak about was the second one. Um, the Nazis really laid waste to the cemetery, so not much of it is left, but this is the cemetery in which Moses Mendelssohn was buried, so it has a very particular sort of cultural resonance beyond the resonance that it might have for the Jewish community. It is marked oddly by, um, I mean, it's not oddly, it's marked by a memorial in the front. Um, the memorial itself is a little bit odd here. It's a memorial that was placed here by the East Germans. So of course, we're also getting into this complexity of how did West Germans deal with Nazi history and Jewish history and how did East Germans deal with Nazi history and Jewish history. Um, but this is a sculpture group that was actually uh, designed for uh, the, the concentration camp in Ravensbrück. And Ravensbrück was, of course, a women's camp. It was not an extermination camp. And Ravensbrück was primarily for uh, political prisoners. It wasn't necessarily directed for Jewish prisoners. But that's why you're seeing women and children here and you aren't seeing any men. So it's, it's again, these sort of readings and re-readings and sort of complex readings of history. Where the Ehrliches did go to synagogue was close to where they lived and they went to one in the Lindenstrasse and it looked like this and it had a building in the front and that building contained a school and contained various offices for community services and then there was a courtyard and then the synagogue was in the back buried within the interior of the block and this is what that synagogue looked like and again you see that this also had uh, an, an organ right so the synagogues there's a huge there's a first synagogue that was built very early on at the end of the 17th century, what came to be called the Old Synagogue. 
Then there was another second synagogue built in the middle of the 19th century, the new synagogue, and that was it until the end of the 19th century. And then there was a plethora of synagogue construction because so many Jews were moving to Berlin and the, and the community became a, a well-to-do community by and large. And so you see the construction of many synagogues around the turn of the century, most all of which were destroyed, of course, in November of 1938. So again, just to uh, locate this, and here I just put a dot on where the uh, Lindenstrasse synagogue would have been. So it was really just down the street from where the family lived, right? They could just walk down the street to services. Um, stepping back a little bit, I wanted to use this plan. This is, and maybe just to show you, this is the center of historical Berlin. It's basically marked by this V shape here. This is Baroque planning, the rondelle at the bottom. The core of sort of medieval Berlin is simply here and it grew out into this direction. And that was all of Berlin for many, 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 many years. Berlin really expanded in the mid 19th century and expanded very, very quickly. Um, so this is a plan of Berlin from 1786. It's still really a tiny city. There's not much there, right? Nobody, there wasn't much interest in going to Berlin. It was a religiously tolerant city by and large because it wanted people to move to Berlin. So religious tolerance was a way of saying, okay, the Catholics can come here, the Protestants out of Czechoslovakia can come here, the Huguenots can come here, Jews can come here too. And the, 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 the history of Jewish culture in Austria and the sort of movement between Austria and Prussia is an interesting one as well. But it was a religiously tolerant city. And I just wanted to just draw your attention to, again, this is where the Ehrlich family lived, to these two sites here. And this was built as a courthouse very early on. And that courthouse has now become the Jewish Museum in Berlin. So this building still exists. This is a Baroque building. You can see exactly the same footprint here. And it survived the Second World War. And there's a long history about this becoming first the Berlin Museum and then this was supposed to be the Jewish wing of the Berlin Museum and then it all became the Jewish Museum. But this is a Jewish Museum. So if you've been in Berlin, I assume you've visited this structure. This other one is maybe um, a little bit more complex to describe. This was a villa. It was built again pretty much at the same time. This is uh, built in the um, 18th century, right? So this would have been a, also an 18th century building. And you can see it a little bit clearer in plan here. This plan, by the way, is from 1910. And you can see just this forecourt here, this kind of turnaround, and then the building. And you can see this building here and this little group of buildings in this location. And what happened, I mean, one is it's, it was quite an elegant building with quite elegant gardens in the back. This is the building from I think this photograph is from the 1890s. You can see this kind of drive into the Port Kasher. Uh, this is from the 1920s, so you can see the cars. Um, this is the, you know, a salon in, you know, it was really a palais. It was really quite an exquisite structure. Uh, this stair hall has historical significance to architects in particular because it is a wrought iron stair that was inserted in the early decades of the 19th century into this 18th century structure by Carl Friedrich Schinkel. So Carl Friedrich Schinkel is the forerunner of Prussian modernism and arguably one of the forerunners of modernism and arguably the John A. Russell building exists on campus in part because of Schinkel and, and Schinkel's thinking and teaching about architecture. So this had a real significance. And what happened was, after the Nazis came to power, this became Gestapo headquarters. So, who moves into Gestapo headquarters? Well, this guy. So this is Reinhard Heydrich, right? And Heydrich is really known as being one of the worst, right? He is one of the most brutal uh, Nazi perpetrators, and he was the person who chaired the Wannsee Conference. He is assassinated in 1942. He's assassinated in uh, Czechoslovakia. Uh, 
but you can see his significance here. This is the funeral commemoration, and you can just see who all showed up to the funeral. These are Hydra's two sons, but you can see here this is Himmler, Hitler, and Goering, right? So he was a major figure in all of this. This is what the, um, the, that, that palais, that villa, that palais, looked like at the end of the war. I mean, nothing much left. And this is what it looks like today. It was located right here on this site. And this is now the new building for the topography of terror. And I wanted to show this just simply again, the complexity of histories and the adjacencies and how does one deal with these adjacencies. Because what we have here really in close proximity to where the Ehrliches lived is on one hand a site that commemorates the victims and another site that speaks very specifically to the perpetrators, right? So that's also the complexity of these stories, right? And how, how do you deal with that complexity of perpetrators and victims? And how do you deal with them when they're just a few blocks apart? So I'm going to show you one of the frustrating things about this work is that you can never get quite right, the right photograph that you want. So the question is, what does this building actually look like here? Mauerstrasse 3. And so these arrows give you the four views that I'm going to run through relatively quickly. These are from the end of the 19th century. And they really, they start at the bottom here. So it's that one, that one, then that one, and the final one is looking from the top. And this is the street looking up Friedrichstrasse. So again, the major north-south organizer in Berlin. Interestingly enough, this building still exists. And um, this, these two buildings, for those of you who know Berlin well and who are architects in the audience, this is the OMA project in Berlin. This is the site that the OMA project was built on. Um, then just moving into the Mauerstrasse, this is sort of older Berlin. These are mid 19th century buildings or early 19th century buildings. So they're somewhat smaller scale. Um, some of them are still quite small scale. These would have been upscaled at the beginning of the 20th century. And this is the final one looking from the north to the south. And what we see here is this church. And the church is also a Baroque church. This is a painting from 1903. And this is, again, a mark of religious tolerance because this was for the, the Lutheran or the Protestant community fleeing, essentially, Prague. And it follows, uh, let's say, this community, a church. This is called the Bethlehem Church. That There is a Bethlehem Church also in Prague that has its own particular history and its own particular history of Catholic persecution of Protestants as well. So this was one of the safe havens, let's say, for this community that was granted safe haven by the early Prussian kings. Uh, this is a photograph from 1907 or 1910. And this is the maddening part of this, this image. The house is just simply out of frame here. So I've spent endless amounts of time. And it shows up finally on this postcard. And I've never seen a German version of this postcard. But this is the building. This is where they would have lived. So, you know, one of these bay windows would have been one of their bay windows. And since he had his office in his, in his home, it probably would have been, you know, the, the first story and not an upper story. So we have the church and we have the home. And I wanted just to talk a little bit about this because this becomes really interesting. This is a map from, or a plan from 1910. And this is a market hall. This was built as a market hall. Berlin had a huge program of constructing market halls in the 1880s and 1890s. And those are well documented. You can see the shape here. It's just rotated 90 degrees to the right. But this is it, the market hall in plan. It's a market hall in section. And we have here the elevation of the market hall on the Zimmerstrasse. And interestingly enough, uh, Benno Walter had his home right next door to this building. So that right next door becomes really important. And market halls looked like this. And there are still one or two market halls in Berlin that kind of look like this. Most of them were either dismantled or they were destroyed during the war. But 
it being in this neighborhood, this particular market hall, it was close to another market hall. It didn't really work well. So after the First World War, it was converted to a concert house. And it was called Clue. And it became the largest dance hall in all of Berlin. It could seat 4,000 people. And so you see lots of dancing programs and the like. There's a real sort of discussion about this. It really is a prominent location. It's in the center of the city, and it is simply you know, the largest dancing hall. It is across from where the Ehrlich family lived. So here, it goes through various permutations in its kind of reorganization from market hall to dance hall. So you can see it gets modernized and modernized. And finally, this is the final iteration as the dancing hall. And you can see it really is a huge area. As a huge area, it also was open to private events, of course. And one of the things that happened after Hitler was released from prison in Munich, where he was incarcerated after the Beer Hall Putsch, was that Hitler was forbidden to hold public speeches in Prussia. He just simply, it was simply forbidden. He could not attend any public rallies in 1927. But he could attend a rally here. And so the first, if you know how Nazis organized GAUs, the first GAU for Zammlung, the first GAU conference, was held on May 1st, 1927, in the dance hall. It held 4,000 people. These are SA members. You know, this is for me, it kind of boggles my imagination to know here is the Ehrlich family across the street from a Gau for Zammlung with 4,000 SA members, right? SA members were essentially street thugs, right? This is an extraordinary sort of collision of things, right? There are no written records about this. There are no photographs that put the Ehrliches next to these events, but this is where they lived, right? So this is what they would have experienced. This building, the front building, still remains. And this is a really interesting building because as the Nazis came to power, this was known as simply a site for the National Socialists. So into this building, which had been designed as a market hall and so therefore could carry real weight on its floor structures, right, they moved in printing presses. And so two publications were printed in this house which is right next to where Benno Walter lived, right? One is the Ungrip, and this was Goebbels' own propaganda sheet, right? This is all right there. And the other one was, you know, the Black Corps, which is the, the official SS organ. And this is just an, an announcement, essentially, of, you know, Heydrich's assassination and that he gave his life for the Reich. So this is all happening right there. These are the adjacencies that happen next to each other. So if that wasn't enough, the dance hall then in the 1940s, so I'm moving ahead a little bit and then I'll back up again, but I'm just showing you the trajectory of this site. The dance hall then gets repurposed one more time. And of course, if you know the history of Berlin and the factory action of February 1943, where all of those Jews that were in force were forced to perform forced labor in various factories throughout Berlin. They were all to be rounded up in one day. And that meant that there was a roundup of an anticipated eight to 10,000 Jews. And the question was, well, where do we put eight to 10,000 Jews that we are rounding up in one day? And so this dance hall, market hall, was repurposed as, again, one of these collection points. So, so that becomes the life of this site as well. It becomes a collection point for Jews that are rounded up in this event. And of course, that event, that particular event of the resistance for Jews who were in mixed marriages becomes the topic of the Rosenstrasse. So again, if you know this story of Jewish women resisting or of Aryan women married to Jewish men or you know, it's basically Aryan women married to Jewish men who are resisting their men being taken away 
right? This is one of the real hallmarks of resistance within Nazi Berlin. And so this is also anchored in this site, right? This is not the Rosenstrasse, but this is where many of those people were brought for that roundup. And one of the interesting accounts of being in, in let's say, held in this site is by this individual, Peter Adel, who was a graphic artist, who writes an incredibly moving account. I won't read it here, but I, if anybody's interested, I can give you the information about being held here for a period of days. And he is eventually, he's transported to Auschwitz. But also a very interesting history here, he is a graphic artist. So he's then brought back to Sachsenhausen and becomes part of the campaign in Sachsenhausen for producing counterfeit currency because he's such a good graphic artist. So he actually survives the war. He moves to West Germany for a while, but decides that West Germany is still too problematic as a, as, as a country and then moves to East Germany. There's also a memorial here, and that memorial here talks very specifically about the building being destroyed in the Second World War. But this memorial lists all of the various usages of this particular building. And I'm just going to show you a few more slides of what actually happened to the site, because it's such a remarkable series of images. So we'll first of all go to this image. So there are many military images when you get into 1944 and 1945. The Americans conducted uh, daytime bombing raids, the British nighttime bombing raids. This is a particularly stunning photograph because these bombers flew in formation, some higher, some lower, and of course when they dropped their bomb loads, they had to make sure that they weren't dropping, the higher planes weren't dropping bombs on lower planes. And you can see already from this photograph what is going to happen, that is what happens. But in this photograph, you can see, if we zoom in on it, well, can't, you can see the rondelle here. So this is turned north as sort of to the bottom left. And you can see then the, the location here. You can see the church. You can see the group of buildings. You can see this is the Friedrichstrasse. And this red line is where the wall actually is built in post-war Berlin. So there are interesting ways of how do you track through what happens to these sites. If you can't get street photographs, what other kinds of photographs can you get? So this is the inner part of the city. This is where, this is the church, obviously. This is now turned the other direction where north is going to the right. But this is where they lived. It's in this location. Pay attention just to the density of buildings here, right? This is dense inner city, late 19th, early 20th century construction. This is an aerial photograph from 1943, where all of this is still pretty much in place. And here you see the church, and you see this complex of buildings here. If we zoom in, this is the church, and this is where they lived, right? That is number three. And this is an aerial from 1945, and you can now see that everything is completely burned out. The church is burned out, the buildings are burned out. You can see, essentially, the interior partitions of this particular building. This is to show you where the wall was then, where the wall would ultimately be built. This is the Friedrichstrasse. This is the burned out Gestapo headquarters. This is a building that the Gestapo took over as essentially administrative and cell space. This is Goering's aviation ministry. This is the Reichskanzlei. This is where uh, Hitler had his offices. And this is where Goebbels had his propaganda ministry. So this is a pretty amazing sort of density of uh, buildings, but they're still standing. And this is 1945. And this is what it looks like in 1953. So under the East Germans, and the West Germans did this to some extent as well, but the East Germans did it to really a grand extent, so much of the city was simply erased. And this is also one of the difficulties of how do you reclaim memory when so much of a city is erased. And here we can see the site, right? All of these buildings are now completely gone. The shell of the church still exists here. The building next door, still exists as something of a shell, but everything is erased here. It's just simply gone. 
It's gone. It's been disappeared. But the story doesn't end here. This is 1953. And in 1953, of course, there was the uprising in East Berlin against the, the Soviets by the East Berliners. And so this is one of the first, this is like the, you know, the Prague Spring, right? This is, this, this is the first real uprising against Soviet control. And this is an image of, basically, these are still World War II Russian tanks. These are T-34s. And these are all West Berliners just sort of wondering what's going on. And of course, the Russian tanks are there to keep West Berliners out of East Berlin. No wall yet. But here you can see just a glimpse of the church that still exists. Everything else is cleared out here, right? It's just gone. And then you have then in 1961 in the same location, right? Because this is Friedrichstrasse. This is Checkpoint Charlie. You have, of course, this. And you have almost the beginnings of World War III uh, as to this was the beginning of the construction of the wall. And the site would have been just to the, they live just to the, uh, left out of frame here. One of the reasons that I'm showing this is that in terms of memory and family memory and the like is that Gerd, I showed you who Gerd was, we'll come back to Gerd, he, he got out and he had three daughters, one of whom was named Marion, and in the 1960s he brought his family to Berlin and he went to Checkpoint Charlie and he showed them all where he used to live and the 12-year-old girls didn't understand what he was talking about. It made no sense. How can you live in a wall? So when the wall is built, it begins to look like this. Here you can still see the shell of the church, but everything else is gone. And then, of course, there's a guard tower because the wall becomes ever more elaborate and the kind of entry into Berlin becomes ever more elaborate. And then it becomes, in the 1980s, it becomes this. It becomes this huge sort of checkpoint area. And you can see here, this I found such a fascinating photograph because the building is literally, I mean, the buildings are gone, right? Where the church was is a parking lot. But this area in here where that group of buildings stood is now literally inside the wall, right? It is in that whole checkpoint area. The buildings themselves are in the death strip, right? So this was just such an extraordinary tracking through of like how do you reclaim these sites, how do you reclaim these memories. And of course, all of this is now gone, right? Post reunification, all of this went. So that is street number one. Street number two is in the west. It's called the Giesebrechstrasse. And the Giesebrechstrasse is this diagonal street here. And this is an early map, this is from 1904, when this neighborhood is largely, but not completely, built out yet. The building typology is very clear. It's the same kind of pattern that's constructed over and over again. Um, in terms of location, again, just to orient everybody, it is here. This is where they lived in between the two sites. And this is where that photograph is taken from. That photograph is actually taken from this site. And they, had, they looked north. And if you look at this closely here, this is the Reichstag. And so there is an account by Gerd of standing on the balcony and watching the burning of the Reichstag in 1933. So, so they, they have moved out of the inner city, but they are still close to everything that is going on. And then they move to this location here. The zoo, just for reference, is right here. Uh, the Technical University of Berlin is right here. And we can zoom in here, and we have just all of the addresses. This is a very short street. This street is 350 meters long. And so this street, unlike the Mauerstrasse, became, this is a residential area. The Mauerstrasse is sort of inner city. It's a mix of residential and commercial, lots of things going on. This is a residential street. And out of this short street, there are 22 buildings on the street. There are more than 120 people who were deported to death camps out of 350 meter long. It's just two blocks long. It's a tiny street. So the street is lined with stumbling stones, and I'll come to the stumbling stones in a minute. Here we see what the street looks like today. It's a very green street, lots of trees. It's very upscale. Um, 
I was looking not to buy, but just to look at an apartment on the you know, Bel Etage on the street in the summer, and it was going for three and a half million euros. So this is an upscale neighborhood. This is what it looked like historically. This is sort of the long view taken from up here and looking down to Kufrstendam. Kufrstendam was really one of the streets that, the, let's say, were Jewish, or where there were a lot of Jewish stores and therefore there's a lot of anti-Jewish activity. So this is the long view down and this is a shorter view down and this is number 15. And this is the building that they moved into, was number 15. So, and again, another view of number 15. This is probably from 1910. The trees are so small, they've just been planted. The trees, of course, grew. What this was interesting here is that this is in an area when Speer, Albert Speer developed his master plan under Hitler's orders in 1939, 1940. He created areas in Berlin that were specifically supposed to be Jew-free areas. And so that meant that Jews there's a very complicated process of how you would move Jews out of apartments. Jews couldn't hold, they, they couldn't hold uh, uh, contracts anymore for rentals. Um, there, there, are lo there are lots, there's lots of detail around how this was affected. But that means that Jews were moved into areas where they could still reside, often as subtenants of other Jews who were there. And at the same time, one of the interesting phenomena of Berlin is that Berlin was, under the National Socialists, one of the safest places to be in Germany because it was a big city and you had a certain degree of anonymity in Berlin, whereas in small towns you didn't have that anonymity. Everybody knew who you were, everybody knew that you were Jewish, everybody knew that that was your store, and so you know, they, they would do something about that. In Berlin, you know, people could could hide in plain sight in many ways. And so there are increasing numbers of Jews coming to Berlin, even as Jews were leaving Germany generally and leaving Berlin as well, of course. But here you can see that this is in an area that still isn't designated as a Jew-free area. And so you see here, this is um, a copy of letterhead, so Hugo Ehrlich. And I don't know, there's no date on this letter, but it's interesting here. One of the things, of course, when the Nazis came to power, various professions were immediately excluded from being able to um, actively pursue those, those professions. Notaries were one of the areas that Jews were immediately excluded from. Architecture was another area that Jews were immediately excluded from. Doctors, nurses, more complicated histories. You could then only have Jewish patients. If you were an attorney, then you could only have Jewish clients. So you could be an attorney for a period of years after the Nazis came to power. But at a certain point, you were simply not allowed to be an attorney anymore, period. So he's actually marked this out, right? He's just X'd it out on his letterhead. But here we have the address. And what happened to Hugo is that he somehow was picked up, don't really know the specifics, and he was brought to Sachsenhausen, uh, in the night of Reichskristallnacht. And he didn't spend much time in Sachsenhausen. He was released on the 4th of December, 1938. And you see his name here on a list of people who are released. And you can see also just how people are categorized, right? That, you know, there are, because people were, since they weren't, accused of anything, right? They were put into Schutzhaft, which means protective custody. So you're simply keeping people in protective custody. But there are different categories here. The people who didn't like to work, and how many of those are Jews, and how many of those are Sinti and Roma. You know, there are different categorizations. But at any rate, he is out relatively early on, and he returns then to this address in Giesebrecht 15, and he is part of, let's say, what is captured in um, essentially a survey that's done as to who lives where and what is their lineage. And so you can see the entire family here, the Abstammung, this means who are your grandparents, and to have four Js means that all four of your grandparents are Jewish grandparents. So this is something that was officially captured, right? This is in the spring of 1939, so clearly he's back from Sachsenhausen in the spring of 1939. One other woman at this address, of course, has no Jewish grandparents. But 
I'm talking about what are the juxtapositions here in these streets, in these environments? What did they see? What did they live through? So I want to talk just briefly about number 11. So they live at number 15. Number 11 is four houses up on a very small, very intimate little street. And we have to talk about this woman, Kitty Schmidt, the older woman and her daughter. And Kitty Schmidt runs a brothel in Berlin. And the Nazis didn't care for brothels. And so at a certain point, she decides to flee Germany with her daughter. And she is caught at the border. She's stopped at the border by the Gestapo because she was a relatively well-known madame. And she was stopped at the border. And the Gestapo gave her two choices. They said, you can either go back to Berlin and run a brothel for us, or you can go to a concentration camp. So she came to Berlin. This is her daughter. This is a beach scene. And she opened up, I'll just go back here, she opened up a brothel in number 11 called the Pension Schmidt. And that brothel was organized under, once again, Heydrich. And the reason why is that he basically wanted to provide entertainment to high-ranking Nazi and foreign officials and, you know, and, and get them relaxed and get them drunk and see what their true thoughts were. So there was this whole sort of discussion around what actually occurred in this house. So there is a discussion that all of the rooms were wired and that there were uh, people in the basement recording conversations that were taking place, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. What is actually true or not with regard to that is unknown. There's a whole sort of almost mythology that's developed around that. But this did exist. I mean, this brothel did exist, and it was frequented by high-ranking Nazi officials. So you have on a street that has at least 100 Jews living in it, you know, maybe not quite yet for fear of their lives, but certainly in fear, and you have a, really a truly sort of high-end bordello for high-ranking Nazi officials. Just imagine the cars that were pulling up at night, right? I mean, this is part of your life. This is part of what's going on in your neighbor's house. And this has been the subject of many publications. Kitty Salon just came out two years ago. Um, it is the subject of being revisited over and over again by newspapers, what is actually true and what's not true. Here we see that Netflix is interested in this story, so watch for the mini-series. And probably the, the most famous version is the Tinto Brass, sort of 19, mid-1970s, which is really a salacious, sort of over-the-top Nazi S&M story of Kitty's Salon here, right, or Salon Kitty. And this is, you know, this is really truly over the top, but it's part of now the memory that's embedded in that street, too. So there's a kind of salon kitty tourism, right? People want to know where this place was, right? So they actually come and visit the street. It's one of the strange sort of after effects. If the other street has Checkpoint Charlie, this street has Salon Kitty. But it's also, I mean, in fairness to Tinto Brass, it was also, you know, his attempt in the 1970s to come to terms with what that that Nazi history was in terms of its social functioning, in terms of its aesthetics, and, and what the appeal of it was. And we do see some real academic work addressing that. But we also know from the 1970s that there were a series of films, uh, The Tin Drum by Volker, Sch Volker Schlorendorf, Schlorendorf, Seven Beauties by Lina Wertmüller, and The Night Porter by Ileana Cavani that were all trying to address what the allure was of sort of Nazis and Nazi power and Nazis in uniform. So this is all sort of also kind of anchored in the street. What is interesting is in the street there was in fact a cinema on top of everything. And that cinema, at least after the war, was showing American Westerns. So different cultures, different ideologies, and they're all right next to each other. I'll come back one more time to Salon Kitty at the end. So here we have Salon Kitty. The cinema was actually here. So it was just diagonally across the street from where the Ehrliches lived at a time when they would no longer have been allowed to attend the cinema. Stepping back a little bit here, um, I mentioned Oranienburg. This is where Sachsenhausen is. I just want to show you another location on the Berlin map, right, writ large. 
And this is where Weissensee is. So this is where the Weissensee conference took place. And this is a villa, you know, a nice villa. Uh, history to who owned this villa and how this villa came to be in the hands of the Rice Security Services. But it's, of course, in this villa that in January of 1942, that these men met for an early morning meeting and produced this protocol. And you see here who is who, and I'll just mention in addition to Heydrich being part of this, that Eichmann is also part of this, so Adolf Eichmann. So this then results in this list, which is simply a list of all the Jews in Europe, just rounded off, and the conclusion that there are 11 million, and this is how do we, how do we deal with this, and this is where the end losing, the final solution is actually, um, that's the conclusion of this early morning meeting. And you see here, that in, instead of asking people to, to emigrate, right, Ausfunderung is emigration, that this is now evacuation. And evacuation was, of course, one of those uh, terms that in a city that's being bombed, to be evacuated might be considered to be a good thing, but evacuation here meant simply um, shipping Jews off to extermination camps. So, so my question is, like, how did this actually work? How did it work in Berlin, right? You have people living in these houses. How did this actually work? And you would get then a letter, and here we have a letter, or at least a form for a letter, dated the 29th of May, 1942. So after the final solution, things move quickly, right? There is this real move towards mass deportation now out of Berlin. There are not many Jews in Berlin, but but those that are there are supposed to be deported and deported quickly if they are not engaged in forced labor. And so the letter would actually come from the Jewish Cultural Association of all things, right? So the letter would be sent from the Jewish Cultural Association and you would get a list of what you could take with you if you were male, what you could take with you if you were female, what you were to uh, leave behind, your documents you leave behind, et cetera, et cetera. And it's, even, it's very, very precise here. Um, what do you do with your Stars of David, right? You, if you have clothes that you're leaving, Stars of David need to be removed. Uh, if they're clothes that you're taking, Stars of David need to be on those clothes. The reason that the clothes, that it needed to be removed from those clothes is that those clothes would, of course, be taken and given or sold by the Nazis. And of course, nobody wanted to know that these had belonged to Jews. And it really gets down to, um, within all of this, uh, even just the medicines that you can take. And one of the things that you are specifically not allowed to take is medications in your hand baggage, because at this point in time, so many Jews in Berlin were committing suicide. And once you were in the machinery of deportation, it actually became illegal to try to commit suicide to avoid deportation. I mean, you, it just, there's a, there's a fine-grained perversity to this. I mean, one of the things that has been, I mean, I find this exhausting. And one of the things that was so exhausting is that the more you know, the worse it gets. I can only say that. The more you know, it just gets worse and worse. So what happens then? You know, so these people were deported. And you can see here, these are the stumbling stones in, in, in this street, right? And there are more than 120. And you can see couples, right, who were deported. And they're all here, right, 1942. There's some in 1943, but the deportations are all in 42, or, or more or less in those two years, 42, 43. So these are all uh, Auschwitz, except for one who's, who's sent to Warsaw for whatever reason, right? So the destinations, this street has another geography. This, this was something, it took a while for me to understand it, and I and I'm don't I'm struggling with how to even represent it. But inscribed in this street is another geography, and that or another topography, and that is the topography of the Holocaust, right? It is the topography of all of these other locations. Auschwitz, of course, being the most well known, and this is how they're located. They're located in front of the houses, and one of the things that I found so difficult in this street is that. You know if you leave your home of many years, 
your tendency is to look back, right? It's just to look back at your front door and to ask yourself the question, will I ever see this place again, right? So, so this is, for these people who were deported, this is essentially the last view that they had. This is reconstructing what they saw of their homes, right? And the hallways still exist. You know, some of them have been upgraded with marble tiling. Some of them are more uh, original. But here we see, uh, again, another series of destinations, right, as it were. So we have Auschwitz, but we also have Treblinka. We also have Riga. We have Rasiku, uh, Warsaw again, again Treblinka. Uh, so these, this is again this kind of other topography in the street. And this happens over and over and over and over again in the street. So the street is really, the street itself is a memorial. It's an amazing space. It's a horrifying space. It's a very moving space. I, I don't really, I mean, I, I haven't quite settled how I feel about all of this myself. It's very complicated for me at any rate. So these are again the hallways, or you have something like this, right? So, I mean, just count how many people were in this house who were deported, right? So, you know, it, it is truly remarkable. So again, here we have, you can see that this entire family, right, the Schlesinger family gets moved out. And we can see here that Reha Schlesinger was born in 1942, right? And she's deported in early 1943, January 1943. So what happens, what else happens in this street? The street's a very, very, very strange street, very difficult street. It's a very typical street though. Um, after Heydrich was uh, assassinated, his successor was, um, was this individual by the name of Kaltenbrunner. And Kaltenbrunner moves into house number 12, right? Jews are no longer living in these buildings. These are vacant apartments. A lot of Berlin has been bombed. You're looking for nice accommodation, so you move into this neighborhood. Kaltenbrunner is, again, a nefarious character. He is tried in Nuremberg. He's caught. He's tried in Nuremberg, and he, has, he is hung in 1946. Um, then there is this person, Paul von Hase. Paul von Hase has a different trajectory because Paul von Hase was part of the group who tried to assassinate Hitler in July of 1944. So he is arrested in July of 1944 and he is hung in Plattensee in, in August of 1944. So this is part of the history of the street as well. And so we have this kind of, you know, this, this, this layering of these difficult and strange stories all in this location. And just to come back to briefly before I move on to just one more, to number 11 in Salon Kitty, there is a woman who is Jewish who was brought with false identity papers to that house to work in the bordello as a housekeeper who actually survived in this bordello to the end of the war and survived the war and then moved to New York. This is a true story. I mean, it did exist. There, there is documentation about all of this. So this is also how do you survive in this kind of environment? She survived under false papers in the center of it all. And this is really the almost the purloined letter story, right? The, the way to hide something is to hide in the plainest of sight, right? So this is what she did. But there's another woman to, who also intersects the street, and her name is uh, Stella Goldschlag, and this is also one of the complicated histories in Berlin, where Stella becomes, there's a, there's a background story to her. She's, she's arrested by the Gestapo, she's tortured, she wants to save her parents who are going to be deported, but she ends up turning into what's called a greifer, which is a catcher, because she knew Jews in the city. And so she went around with Gestapo agents and basically pointed Jews out to Gestapo agents. And the number of Jews who fell victim to her pointing them out is unknown, but it's at least in the hundreds, if not in the thousands. So she was known, she was stunningly beautiful. Um, you know, many people were attracted to her, and so she used that to her advantage as well. And so this is her with two other people who were working with the Gestapo, also Jews. So there is this history in Berlin as well. And she ends up becoming friends with a, a 
a Jewish woman who runs a shoe store in the eastern part of the city who is married to an Aryan, and she lives in number 15. So of all things, and there's a twist to this, and I'll come to this twist at the end of the story, um, Stella Goldschlag ends up spending a lot of time in exactly the same building that the Ehrlich family lived in, right? So there is, again, this because it's a Jewish neighborhood, right? There is this overlay. And she's also someone who continues to be sort of in a kind of um, active memory of the past. So this is an article from 2021, you know, the beautiful and the evil. Um, you know, what exactly did she do? This is her being interrogated in 1946. Um, a figure based on her was played by Kate Blanchett in Steven Soderbergh's The Good German. Um, but the number of people that Kate Blanchett apparently uh, exposed was, was very small. It was 12, I think, in the movie as compared to actually what Stella Goldschlag did. And she's now the subject of something of a biopic uh, that will be released in 2024. This is just shown, this film is just shown in the Zurich uh, Film Festival to not very good reviews. But there is again this kind of, what, what is this world? What is this life? So what happened when people, so we're, we're moving on towards the final chapter here, what happened where people were actually deported, right? So this is a still from the new film about Stella Goldschlag. And this comes back to then these images here. And these are three images. There's the same image of the synagogue and the Levetzostrasse. And that's what we're going to talk about here just ever so briefly. So I've changed the color scheme here. Uh, these are the three in blue now, the locations of where the Ehrlich family lived. The two yellow dots are where these Sammellager, these sort of gathering houses were. This was next to the cemetery that I showed you a photograph of, and this is the synagogue. And what happens in 1941 to 1942, and this is where the Wannsee Conference plays a real role, is that Jews were, prior to 1942, they were all deported from either, if they were going to Theresienstadt, they would be deported from the main train station, Anhalter Bahnhof. But that was straight to Theresienstadt, and that was only for Jews going to Theresienstadt. Jews who were going to the east were then brought to Platform 17 in Grunewald. And that's the very well-known train station, that there are lots of historical information about that train station. But they would be, as fuel became ever scarcer because of everything having to go to the various fronts, um, they made the Jews walk this distance, right? This is eight kilometers through residential neighborhoods. And so after the Wannsee conference, there was a rethinking. If we're really going to empty out Berlin, we have many more Jews, we have many more trains, and we can't have them all walking eight kilometers. So they changed the destination to this much less well-known location, which is essentially the freight train station in Moabit. So it's up here. So this was also easier to reach from both of these points. So there is a kind of, there is this topography of deportation in Berlin. And so what would happen here, just coming back to the letter, right, that I showed you, this is dated the 29th of May, and you didn't have any time at all, right? So you would be deported on the 2nd of June. So, you know, you're being deported in four days. You have to organize everything. And it says here, basically, you know, when you have to deliver your, your large suitcases to the Levetzostrasse 7-8, right? Um, so when you have to deliver it, what the time frame is. And then on June 1st, as of six in the morning, that someone would come to your apartment, you would have to leave your apartment and they would seal your apartment. And the issue of sealing your apartment is again so that everything that was in the apartment would stay in the apartment and either somebody else would move into a furnished apartment or what was in that apartment would be sold, right? So the idea is that everything would be sealed and you would give your, your apartment, your building key and your apartment key to the official who was there to seal the apartment. So there was no time between really receiving a letter and reporting then to the synagogue or to this, what had been the synagogue. 
And this is the Levetso Strasse Synagogue. I mean, it's a very grand building. It was completed in 1907. It's part of this huge program of building synagogues throughout Berlin. You see here, there's still a gap between this apartment building next to the synagogue and the church that's at the end of the street. This is a slightly later photograph with this 1930s, very elegant school that was built there. And what you have to do then, these are, dots are a little bit smaller, this is where the synagogue is and this is where the point of deportation is in, in Berlin. And just zooming in on what that looks like, if you zoom in a little bit more, what that looks like today, there's still some train lines, there's a road, there's a kind of building supply store, right? I mean, this is all contemporary stuff. In 1939, this is where the rail lines were actually laid. And what we're looking at here is this ramp. This is a ramp that would take you from the street through a kind of industrial ribbon down to where the actual uh, train lines were. And this is the location of that ramp today. It's simply that, between those two points. And that distance is marked out like this. This is the route that people would go from the synagogue by foot to that location. And last summer, I mean, this is, you know, people would be carrying baggage. You were moving 1,000 people at a time through streets, and this is what people with baggage would look like. And, what, and this is not a photograph from Berlin. There are no photographs from Berlin. There are no photographs from Berlin. I mean, if somebody knows of a photograph, I, I, I would like to know. But this is also not a 1,000 people, right? This is just a small group of people. This is a 1,000 people. So a 1,000 people are walking through these streets, right? This is what's so extraordinary. And this past summer, I just walked the route, right? So you're walking by apartment buildings. This building would have existed. Everybody in this building would have looked out onto the street. You walk by two churches. Like, where was the church in all of this? Uh, you walk by a big brewery. You walk by school. You walk by other apartment buildings, right? This is a really, this is a residential neighborhood. There, this is full of people. You don't miss a thousand people walking down your residential street. And you would come to this ramp. This ramp still exists. And then at the bottom of the ramp, there is a rail line that is left. And I don't, I, I can well imagine this is not the original because this is now a memorial site as well. And then the rail just simply ends, right? This is the rail to transportation to the east. And I imagine that these birch trees are planted just simply to also reference that, that destination to the, each, to the east and the birch forests of the east. So at the head of this, there is this route that is mapped out, right, on a, a Corton Steel um, monument. And then just this, this is inscribed in both German and English. And it gives the address of the synagogue. And I mean, the, the final lines here are the ones, all this happened with the active participation of authorities and companies and in full view of the local residents, right? And I think this just says it all. So at the other end of this, at the Levetzo Strasse, the synagogue, the synagogue um, survived the war. It was torn down in the 1950s, and in the 1990s, this memorial was placed there, which I find one of the more striking memorials in Berlin, where you have a combination of, in this surface here, um, a record of all of the synagogues in Berlin that were destroyed during Reichskristallnacht. And so it gives you the synagogue, it gives you the date of construction, it gives you how many people were able to attend that synagogue. Some of them are quite small, some of them are very large, but it basically gives you that information, and it gives you then on this stelae here all of the trains of the deportation to the east, right? So this is from this site, essentially, where all of those trains went. The sculpture is obviously a, a huddled mass of people, and at the other end, there is a kind of stylized uh, freight car that exists here, and this is the interior of the freight car, as it were, that you can move into. So I find this to be really one of the most moving memorials, and I find these two memorials sort of at, at opposite ends, or at, they're sort of bookending this path, right? 
that that whole path is actually a memorial site. That whole path has to be understood as this kind of, um, you know, connector. And this is what you see here inscribed on that stelae of the dates of deportation. And I'm just going to point out the 29th of November, 1942 here. And this was 1001, and this is Berlin to Auschwitz, and here Riga is still at it. I think at this point in time, it was still unknown if Riga was actually one of the destinations of this train, and I think in the meantime, it's been decided it wasn't. But you see this, and you see the numbers, um, and then you see as of fall of 1943, the numbers just decline drastically because there are no Jews left in Berlin, or the Jews that are left in Berlin have all gone underground. So what does this mean now just to return, and this is to close this talk, to this group of people, to Hugo and Gerd and Marion and Gertrude and Benno Walter. So after um, Hugo Ehrlich was released from Sachsenhausen, we know he lived in this house. This is the entry to number 15. And in November of 1940, he died of a heart attack. And so he, he died at home. Apparently somebody came to him with news that really upset him. And on hearing that news, shortly thereafter, he just literally fell over. And he is buried in the cemetery in Weissensee. So, so he was buried. It was possible to bury Jews at this point in time. Uh, this um, gravestone was put up in the 1990s. I don't know if there was a gravestone originally or if there was just a simple plaque, but this is certainly there now. And you see Gertrude mentioned here at the bottom. But what happened is when he, when he died, then you had Gertrude and Gerrit and Marion living in this house. They had lots of uh, subtenants, right? They sort of moved into their own living room. The subtenants had the bedrooms. Uh, Gertrude cooked for everybody. And Gerd, who is a teenager at this point in time, gets caught being out after curfew. Curfew for Jews was 9 p.m. And he was caught uh, being out after curfew. And he was, because of that, he was put in a sort of re-education camp for six weeks or so outside of Berlin, which he describes as being the worst time of his life. Then he was released, but he was on a list then because he'd already been incarcerated uh, of being a socially undesirable. And so by the time we get to late 1941, early 1942, the date's unclear, he is scheduled for deportation. Benno Walter is working for the Jewish community. B'nai Brit doesn't exist anymore, but he's an attorney. He's well thought of. He's part of that circle of people around Leo Beck. And so he gets wind of the fact that Garrett is supposed to be deported. And deportation for Garrett might not have meant the East. It might have meant just simply, simply, right? It might have meant Buchenwald or Dachau or, or Sachsenhausen. He might have been put to work. He was young. He was strong. He might have been put to work. Um, at any rate, Benno married Gertrude then. And he was an old family friend. They, they all knew each other over many years, and he married Gertrude with the thinking that this would also, given his position, help protect her and the two children, Gerrit and Marion. And there is a letter from Gerrit where he actually writes to a friend of his where he refers to Benno as that both he and Marion are very satisfied with their new father. And so they don't even refer to him as the stepfather. They really accept him as their father. So, so this, was, this was very real, right? So, so this became the new family unit. And they then moved to this building. This is where Benno Walter had his apartment. And this building is in the Levetzostrasse. And this is something that I also just sort of struggle with because the synagogue is here and they lived here. And they lived here in 1942, so they knew that Jews were being deported from the synagogue. They, it was unmistakable. So, I mean, it's just, again, there are no written records at all, but just the logic of the situation makes it very, very clear that this is what it is. And I, I walked this distance. It's 250 steps, right? That's it, right? It's 250 steps. It's nothing. And so what happened is that this worked. 
till the summer of 19, it worked through the summer of 1942. All schools were closed to Jewish children. Gerd was working as a forced laborer in the district of Trepto at that point in time. Where, maybe I'll just tell the story about Gerd, where he worked with Stella Goldschlag. And so, so she got to know him. She knew many people through school. She didn't know Gerrit through school. She knew him because they worked in, they were both forced laborers in the same factory. And so in late 1942, just to skip ahead a tiny little bit here, Gerrit goes underground in Berlin. He's, he's a U-boat and there's a, they're called U-boats, right? Jews that went underground are called U-boats. And, and so there, there's a whole other set of stories in relation to that for another talk, another time, maybe, whatever. But in the fall of 1943, he's in a pastry store not far from where they lived in the Giesebergstrasse, and somebody taps him on the shoulder, and he turns around, and it's Stella. And she says, Gerd, we know each other. And she's with somebody else, and he knows full well what's going on. So he literally pushes her to the floor, runs out the building with Gestapo people running behind him, and manages to get away. He's, he's young, he's fast, right? So he gets away, but he knows he needs to leave Berlin because now it, the, the jig is up. Everybody knows he's there. They will be looking for him. So he leaves in 1943, and he, in 1943, on Yom Kippur, he crosses over into Switzerland. So, so that is Gerd's trajectory, and that is why much of this is known. If we backtrack a little bit to the summer of 1942, there was this photograph, and Marion is still in school, but the Nazis, they moved Jews out of public schools into Jewish schools in the late 1930s already. But in 1942, in the spring of 1942, the Nazis closed all Jewish schools too. So she's essentially put to work, and she's put to work as a forced laborer, ostensibly, but it's unclear how much labor she actually did, in the Jewish cemetery in Weissensee. One thing I have to say, there might have been a fair amount to do, because there are reports that in the summer of 1942, so many Jews were committing suicide in Berlin that the Jewish cemetery in Weissensee was, in fact, very busy. But this photograph is taken of her in the cemetery, and I the story of how this photograph still survives is another story, so if anybody is thinking of a question to ask me afterwards, I can tell you the story. But she's with a friend of hers. Her name is Ruth Preuss. So this is her, Marion, laughing, right? This is in the cemetery in the summer of 1945. But what happens is that in November of, of 1942, in November of 1942, the Jewish administration of which Benno Walter is a part is asked very explicitly by the authorities to help facilitate the accelerated de deportation of Jews in Berlin. And this group as a group said no. And when they said no, they were arrested as a group. And so Benno Walter was arrested in, in, that, in that moment. And at that point in time, he wasn't even allowed to return home. He was simply put into the holding house, right, which was the care facility next to the cemetery. And, and his wife and children were told to come to that point with him and to be deported with him. And so this is in November of 1942. And it's at that moment in time that Gerd decides to go underground, right? This had been something that had been talked about. Gerd was old enough. He felt that he could do it. And he just said, okay, I'm going to go underground. But Marion was still too young. She was only 14. So Marion goes with her mother to this site, which is the, the Grosse Hamburger Strasse next to the cemetery. And they're held there for a few days. And don't know when this actually occurred, but I do know from another letter that uh, that. Benno Walter had his birthday, which was the 25th of November, so I'm also cognizant of the fact that yesterday was his birthday, that he had his birthday in that place and that there was an effort made to get him a cigar and some sandwiches and stuff like that, so he would at least have something on his birthday. But they were then deported, and you see here, this is it's amazing what survives and given what hasn't survived, 
But this is the transport list, um, and you see them all here, right? So you see Benno Walter, and you see here Gertrude now carrying um, his last name, and you see Marion still carrying her, 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 her biological father's last name is Marion Ehrlich. Uh, Jews, of course, have to have, you know, either males had to have Israel or Sarah as middle names. That was done by law. And you can see here that this is their address. And you can see that they're grouped together as a family, right? So there's some bracket. And you can see somebody's checked the names off, right? Somebody knows that they are on this train. And so at some point in November of this would have been November 29th, actually. I pointed out that date. November 29th, they all walked down this ramp. It took, generally, it took 24 hours for a train leaving Berlin to get to its destination in the east. And so 24 hours later, on November 30th, they would have been in Auschwitz. So, 